and we're going to be told uh, all about that by Angela Liu, um, one of our interpreters here at the museum. So, oh, there we go. <laughs> and uh, my name is Kashifa. Um, I'm. Uh, I'll be. I'll be the host. Um, and before we do anything else, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes talking a little bit about the BD Museum and a little bit about where we are. Um, so firstly, uh, the BD Biodiversity Museum is on the traditional unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam people. Um, and so you can see the flag of the Musqueam uh, right here in front of you. And I also wanted to show you where the museum is uh, here on a map. So we are here in Vancouver on a UBC campus and we're next to lots of other um, museums. Um, so the Museum of Anthropology, the Botanical Garden is on campus as well. Those are both open. And so is the museum. We're open Tuesday to Sunday, 10 to five. This is the blue whale. This is the biggest specimen we have at the museum. One of over 2 million specimens. And uh, right next to our museum is the Biodiversity Research Center. And this is a place where there's over 50 faculty and researchers who are studying all kinds of different aspects of biodiversity. And you can see some of the organisms being studied on this banner. So you can see some plants, some animals, some insects, things from the ocean. Um, and we've got six different collections in the museum. So uh, we have all kinds of biodiversity represented. We've got uh, from the top left, we've got our tetrapods, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, marine invertebrates, uh, plants and things that look like plants but aren't plants like fungi and lichens, insects, fish and fossils. So we've got lots of really cool things to see. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Angela uh, who is going to be leading us through her presentation. So Angela, feel free to share your slides if you'd like. Thank you. Um, just give me a minute as I set up my okay. screen share. Hopefully everybody is able to see this in full screen. There we go. Great. All right. Thank you everybody for joining me today on my PDF at home. I do want to show both specimens today as well as my presentation slides. And I think the best way for me to do that is to ask everybody to head into the side-by-side -side mode. So all you need to do is just click the screen, the view options next to the green bar and select here. And of course, please pin my video so you can see the specimens in their full glory. And you can just do that by hovering your mouse over my face and clicking the little the three little option button drop down menu from here. And if you have, do you have any questions, feel free to ask that in the chat and we'll help you with troubleshooting this if there are any difficulties. Otherwise, I'm going to get right on started into my, my introduction of what is eco-innovation. And many of you may be able to infer by looking at this word eco-innovation, but simply put, eco-innovation is the design and the development of products that are really specifically geared towards sustainability. And this term, it's, it's pretty broadly used, and but most commonly it's used when we're talking about something called the circular economy. And if anybody knows what that is, it's quite a simple model uh, on the surface of reusing and upcycling our materials and our resources so it minimizes as much waste as possible. So it deviates a little bit from our current system, which is mostly used to pollute. And this is not anything new. A lot of us may be familiar with our recycle, reduce, reuse kind of slogan, but this also expands beyond and also looking at societal uh, changes when we're thinking about sustainability. And although eco-innovation is really targeted to talking about these kind of processes, I also want to deviate just a little bit from this traditional definition and talk a little bit about innovation that are more technologically or materialistically based and things like biomimicry of how things that are taking inspiration from natural processes and natural systems to advance our quality of life and our resources. And although they may not directly be linked to sustainability, they're nonetheless rooted in ecological mechanisms. So to get started about thinking about why eco-innovation is necessary, uh, I want to get started thinking about the problem that causes eco-innovation to be so necessary, so important. And that is our current unfortunate man-made crisis 
of resource and un unsustainable exploitation and er, of resource use. So many of the resources that we're really familiar with is for depowering our energy systems is non-renewable at the current moment. Can anybody think about some of these examples of non-renewables and of course their uses? So maybe a really easy one that I will have to take away from people would be coal. And the use would be anything from heating to electricity to industrial production. Any other ideas out there? If there's anything in the chat, feel free to let me know. Uh, so Nicole has said precious metals and phones. Yeah, definitely. Nancy suggesting plastic. Yes, plastic is a really important one. And we'll be talking a little bit about plastic in just a minute. There's also a lot of other things like, for example, oil or petroleum that's used for to powering our natural our, our vehicles or natural gas, which is powering some of the same things, and a lot of electricity generation. And unfortunately, because these resources are non-renewable, our stocks are steadily diminishing. And this has, this has prompted a lot of scientists to look into other energy sources, most notably renewable sources, to feed this growing demand for our population. And a lot of the new renewables that we think about today are things like solar power, things like hydroelectricity or geothermal energy. And these are really great, but they're large, largely focused on abiotics, abiotic mechanisms, so things that are not living. So scientists actually are now looking into the biotic environment, the living environment, as a growing field of study and innovation. So today we're going to be highlighting a few of these biotic organisms within our discovery lab to see how scientists and different types of engineers are rethinking how we can re re uh, use or be inspired by some of our living environment. And hopefully we can get to an activity in the end of my presentation so you can explore your own creativity of how we can I rethink our world that is really dependent on non-renewables to shift it to a more uh, sustainable system like the circular economy. And one of the things that we just talked about, which Nancy brought up, which is really great, was plastics. And today, plastic pollution is adding really highly toxic substances to our environment and unfortunately adversely affecting the health of a lot of our organisms. And one organism that several scientists and engineers have actually began to investigate and try out to replace plastics is actually, and unexpectedly, I have a, I have a specimen right here, mushrooms. So mushrooms or fungi, which you can see this one here, this is a varnished shelf, may not be the first thing that comes to mind when we're talking about resources to replace plastics. However, there is a really prominent and growing company that is thinking about how we can use mycelium, so the root system of mushrooms you can see here, that is able to produce a material that is really durable and flexible enough to replace a lot of our plastics and it has become a really sustainable alternative. And mycelium and hyphae, which you can actually see a little bit here in the varnish shelf, I don't know if it's close enough, it's a little soft part here, is actually, uh, it's actually creates a fruiting body but also expands beyond up to hundreds of kilometers under the ground as well. So it's a really, uh, really flexible and durable uh, material. So this material has, a, has been produced into a lot of different uh, things. For example, lamps, furniture, and most prominently it has actually been used to replace styrofoam, which is particularly toxic and noxic, noxious within our environment. But it also has been used to do a lot of fashion things, to move away from fast fashion and textiles into things like vegan leather or even concrete blocks and insulation. So I would like to let the inventor of this actually take it away to tell you a little bit about how this is all produced. And do let me know if you can't hear the sound, but I, and I can, I'll be happy to explain along the way. Thanks. Now, mycelium is an amazing material because it's a self-assembling material that actually takes things we would consider waste, things like seed husks or woody biomass, and can transform them into a chitinous polymer, which you can form into almost any shape. In our process, we basically use it as a glue. And by using mycelium as a glue, you can mold things just like you do in the plastic industry. And you can create materials with many different properties, materials that are insulating, fire resistant, moisture resistant, 
vapor resistant, materials that can absorb impacts, that can absorb acoustical impacts. But these materials are grown from agricultural byproducts, not made out of petroleum. And because they're made of natural materials, they're 100% compostable in your own backyard. So this is the inventor of these mycelial blocks, uh, these mycelium furniture, as well as these mycoblocks, that's often called. And oops, and fungus has been a really rising, a, a really rising uh, material that's been used to not only replace plastics, but also a bunch of other non-renewable materials, such as uh, biofuel, for example, which is another really fantastic source of oil that is considered renewable energy. However, there's actually a new type of fungus that has just been discovered that is actually able to grow within landmines, a uh, landfill, sorry, and have these enzymes that can break down plastics within weeks. And I thought that was pretty cool. But uh, mushrooms, when used as biofuel, is a really promising form of renewable energy. However, another fantastic source of renewable energy in terms of biofuel is actually algae. And when we think about biofuel, there's actually common resources that it conventionally comes from, which are often corn, sugarcane, soybean, and these are conventional agricultural products as well. However, because they're agricultural products and because they're food sources, it's often considered not the best use of that, uh, that vegetable or that biomass. So algae was actually experiencing a boom in popularity as a biofuel between 2005 to 2012. And on this picture here, you can actually see it being cultivated within this closed loop system. There's actually two ways that we can cultivate algae for biofuel. And one of them is this fun looking radiator looking uh, uh, closed loop system, which is unfortunately the pricier of the two. But the other one we have is this race trap system, which is open, open looped. And unfortunately it's significantly cheaper, but it has a lot of other uh, other drawbacks to it, such as disease can come in and it also takes up a lot of land. But algae has a lot of benefits as a biofuel crop. They're really productive. And oftentimes it can surpass the amount of oil a acre of conventional corn biofuel can produce because of their high lipid content. So they have a lot of oil within their cells. You can see from this this little diagram here that oil that lipids actually take up almost half of their uh, cell cell cellular butt makeup, and they can actually grow quite efficiently as well, both within the closed loop and the open loop system. So within this closed loop system, they can save a lot of space and save a lot of the land that's needed for other crops, and they're also not very picky about what kind of water they need to grow on. They do need a lot of water, but it can be up anything from storm water to saline water to fresh water. And this is also really good for uh, freshwater conservation when we're thinking about growing crops as that's often a concern when coming to biofuel. And macroalgae, I have a, I have a macroalgae back here, although it's not very uh, relevant to the microalgae that we'll be, we're gonna be talking about. They're a key carbon sequest uh, sequestration storm for carbon dioxide. So growing a algae biofactory actually is able to neutralize a lot of the carbon emissions from factory processes, as well as other things that maybe they want to use these carbon offsets for. However, I did mention that algae biofuel experienced a boom between 2005 to 2012. So what happened afterwards, you may wonder. Unfortunately, and this is often the case with a lot of eco innovations, is that they are currently not comparable with the cost of non renewables of fossil fuels. The production cost of algae, unfortunately, is really high for um, the amount that they, they're able to produce. And unfortunately, they're not as they're not considered as reliable. They unfortunately need a lot of energy. And in terms of the cheaper alternative of the two, they need a lot of space. And all the issues with monoculture applies to algae farms as well, because often a particular species of algae is chosen for their high lipid content and not a lot of diversity in these lovely little ponds here. And they're limited by other things like fertilizer and things that, need, that are needed for the biomass to actually grow. So this is really important to think about when we're thinking about why do we have so many cool alternatives to non-renewables and why we don't switch over immediately. 
there's unfortunately a lot of other uh, drawbacks to some of these. Nonetheless, there's a lot of potential and there needs to be a shift within our current energy system and a, I guess, a, a, an entire shift within our current economic system as well to begin to shift away from uh, conventional fossil fuels. And a lot of work is being done to that. So it's a very promising future. And hopefully we can eventually take all of these EK innovations and move towards circular economy. Angela, is this a good yeah. time for some questions? It is, absolutely. Okay, so I uh, just want to share um, just some thoughts that people have had. So Arlene said fascinating when you mentioned um, the fungi. Um, yeah. And then Nancy had a thought about fungi that I'll mention. So uh, she says, I wonder if the mycelium can be grown indoor stacked structures in indoor stacked structures so it doesn't need as big of a footprint. The algae growing in closed loop looks very compact. Oh, I would. That video that I just showed, literally a few minutes after that, the clip I just uh, ended shows a factory of mycelium being grown in these really compact spaces. And they can grow up to a lot of mycelium. And they're pretty fast growing, too. And as the, as the um, inventor said, they use agricultural byproducts. So it actually is able to reduce the waste from agricultural fields. So yeah, it, it can be um, grown in really compact spaces as well. Awesome. There's two more questions for now. Um, Arnold is asking, I'm curious how much algae would be needed to offset the carbon production in the world today? <laughs> the, the carbon sequestration of algae is really high indeed. They are often the underdog when we're thinking about carbon sequestration. Trees often get all the fame. Uh, however, the need to offset carbon production with bio, biotic processes is a little bit um, difficult because we are producing so much carbon uh, carbon dioxide. Unfortunately, I can't give you numbers for this, but it will a be lot. highly likely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. So there's one more question for now. Uh, Nicole asks, can you do crop rotation uh, with algae monocultures, like with land-based agriculture to replenish nutrients within the water? I think, we, I think that's a that's an area of study that I read briefly <laughs> that is being considered, but because there's particular species that are so sought after, it's diff it's difficult to s for uh, farms that want to mass produce a lot of biofuel to switch to other species. So I guess it would be difficult to do crop rotation, change up the species. However, I think I think that's potential. Mm -hmm. uh, right. one, one more question. OK. Good, good with that. OK. By the way, Arnold says, no problem. It was just a thought. <laughs> it was a good thought. Um, really and then. Audrey asks, in regards uh, to plastics, I've heard of chitin-based plastics. How does that compare to mycelium-based plastics? And which one would you prefer? Oh, I don't think I prefer <laughs> I think I prefer anything that are not plastics. But mushrooms are actually made out of chitin. So um, I do need to, sorry? Oh, no, I that's, think, okay. that's oh, okay. I do need to look into what chitin-based plastics are, but I think mycelium do have chitin in them, so they must be really, really similar. And you can see from the structures that they do have, they are fairly resilient, so I'm going to assume that they're also like that. Yeah, <laughs> chitin is... Chitin, the leaf. Whoa. chitin, sorry. Yeah, chitin is in the cell walls of fungi, but mm -hmm. also in uh, like arthropods, exoskeletons. Yeah. Really great questions. I would love to answer more at yeah, the end of the talk today as perfect. well. Perfect. But we are going to shift gears a little bit, actually. Awesome. Thanks, Angela. To, yeah, thank you for these, those questions. On to our second part of what I would like to encapsulate within my broad definition of eco-innovation, and that is biomimicry. So biomimicry, as defined by the Biomimicry Institute, is the practice that learns from and mimics the strategies found in nature to solve human design uh, challenges. And oftentimes, this term has actually been applied quite overwhelmingly to design principles like architecture, like technology, producing different types of materials. However, today, I also want to let everybody know and draw attention to how biomimicry can also be applied to social processes, economic systems, political movements, and all sorts of things like that in order to, for the ultimate end goal to build resilience and social ecological sustainability. 
And today I'm going to be going over just two examples fairly briefly in the just a dip in the pool in the massive ocean of biomimicry examples. And hopefully everybody is able to take some inspiration from these ideas because we're going to be moving into an activity where I would like everybody to design their very own innovation inspired by biodiversity. So the first uh, the first example I would like to introduce everybody to is something uh, called something inspired by a shark. But I would first like to introduce the issue that prompted this. So biofouling is unfortunately an issue that plagues many industries today. And simply put, it's the accumulation of microorganisms on surfaces. And this is largely applied to marine shipping vehicles, but biofouling in hospitals is also a major concern. Unfortunately, and this, is, uh, this has caused up to over 100,000 hospital acquired infections each year, which is particularly topical today within our unfortunately global pandemic. So one particular issue that arose in hospitals is that the chemical disinfectants that we're using to get rid of these bacteria, these viruses are causing superbugs. These pathogens and viruses are becoming, they're developing immune systems that used to be uh, weak against our chemical disinfectants, but are becoming more immune. So it's more and more difficult for us to kill these superbugs. And they're really becoming an issue in terms of uh, safety and hygiene within a hospital. So what scientists are beginning to think about is maybe not using chemical disinfectants, but rather surface technology. So this first innovation that we're gonna be looking at is something invented by Sharklet, which is this company that produces this surface technology that emulates uh, shark skin. So scientists first discovered this when they were observing the Galapagos shark, this really languid, slow moving shark within uh, tropical waters that scientists expected to find a lot of bacterial buildup because they were so slow, but they actually found almost no bacterial buildup on their skin. And they found that the reason for this was because of the nature of their scales or actually their skin as sharks don't have a lot, have a visible scales that we conventionally know of. So I have a jar of black tip reef sharks here and you can see that the shark skin is really smooth. They don't really have the scales that we often see on fish. And that's because the sharks don't actually have those kind of visible scales. They have something called dermal denticles or placoid scales. Let me just place that back. <laughs> Hopefully that was a success and everybody was able to take a peek at the smooth exterior of our lovely sharks in a jar. And those dermal denticles look something like this middle picture here. They're ridged and they, they are really, really nan nano and microscopic, so it's really difficult to see. That's why we don't see them on the shark. And they have these ridges that make them really hostile environments for bacteria to land on. So Sharklet has began, has uh, created the surface technology to emulate the shape of these thermal denticles for them to become really poorly, poor or hostile environments for things like bacteria and viruses to actually even survive on. So instead of using chemical disinfectants, we're using a, a physical property that really gets rid of the issue of superbugs. And this can help save billions of dollars in healthcare that's currently being spent on disinfecting surfaces and dealing with superbugs. So this is a really cool innovation that has taken the structure of a organism to reapply that into a really concern, a really prominent concern in a lot of industries today. And, and, and of course, uh, sharks can actually be used to into other surfaces to reduce drag within swimsuits and things like that. But this is a particular technology that I would like to talk about today. And another really fantastic innovation is actually for the Shinkansen trains. And this is this might be the trophy child of biomimicry. So some people may be familiar with this, but it was 1989. So hopefully story time, <laughs> 1999. And one of Japan's fastest trains, the Shinkansen, this one here, uh, had a problem. And engineers noticed that whenever it exited a tunnel, a really narrow tunnel, it caused this compressed wave to build up in front of the train. And once it began to exit, the micropressure wave would release in a massive sonic boom that could be heard kilometers away. 
And this is really disruptive to, of course, the surrounding community. Imagine hearing a boom every few minutes from the train exiting the tunnel near you. And of course, really damaging to wildlife uh, in, the, in, the, in the vicinity as well. And another structure that caused all this noise was part of the pantograph. The pantograph was just a thing that attached to the top of the train to connect it to the electricity wires from above. And this would just rattle and vibrate constantly, which of course would cause a lot of excess noise and drag. But fortunately, Eiji Nakatsu, which is the director and the engineer of the railway system at that time, was an avid bird watcher. And he actually took inspiration from three different birds to remodel the Shinkansen. So this is the after, the, the before and the after from the remodeling. So you can notice any of these differences. For the pantograph here, the bottom part of the support, you can see from the previous, it had this kind of rickety structure where there's four prongs on the side, began to become this smooth looking belly shaped structure that's actually been inspired by the Adelie penguin, which is one of the best birds known for swimming in water actually because of their smooth and streamlined spindle shaped body. And their, this belly part was inspired by the belly of that penguin. And the wing tip here was inspired by an owl's wing. So if we just look from the before, this looked quite different from what it looks like today. It's mostly to, re, uh, to attach the top of the train to the wire securely, but this new structure took inspiration from the leading edge of an owl's wing. And that's because an, the leading edge of an owl's wing has a really special structure. Let me see if I can move my camera again. Has a really special structure to allow them to break the turbulence within the, within the air. Is everybody able to see these small, tiny little bristle-like uh, feathers? Gosh, my oh, Angela, here. yes, that's a really good Great. angle. Yep. Thank you for that. bearing yep. with the turbulence. <laughs> um, there we go. And these serrations are able to break up the, the wind when they're flying. So that makes owls actually one of the quietest flying birds in the, in the, in the avian world. And of course, in, in, in coalition with their really soft feathers. But the, this remodeling of the pantograph actually began to input these serrations and they were able to reduce a lot of noise. Up, up to 15% less noise was being used. But most importantly and most significantly was actually the bullet-shaped nose of the kingfisher that, that was used to inspire by the kingfisher. So kingfisher had a really special beak that allowed them to dive into water almost soundlessly. And taking that as an inspiration, they changed the nose of the Shinkansen train to emulate the nose of a kingfisher. And with these changes, the train was able to use 15% less electricity and was 10% faster to this new aerodynamic design, making Shinkansen actually one of the fastest trains in the world today. So that's a lot of really fantastic stuff about from our two examples. But I also want to round it all back to the beginning when I first talked about how eco-innovation is one of the first steps towards achieving the circular economy, a system that rethinks the current economic model and creates a more sustainable market. So the circular economy model actually draws from natural processes as well. So this it's in and of itself is biomimetic thinking. Any ideas of what the circular economy model is inspired by in nature? Any ideas? Uh, Nicole is suggesting food chain and Nancy suggesting ah. the nitrogen cycle. Chloe <laughs> suggesting like life cycles. Yeah, great. That's, those are really great suggestions. But we also want to think of, think, we have to think of a little bit bigger, but I think all those play into the circular economy. This, uh, the design has actually been compared to an ecosystem the processes within ecosystem, the recycling of materials and the uptake of those materials to grow new and better biomass or new and stronger biomass. But life cycle, nitrogen cycle and the food chain all are inherently embedded within our ecosystem processes. So things like economics and models or things that can build resiliency within a community, uh, a really prominent um, scientist thinker, as well as a social justice um, advocate was actually looking at fire ants and how, or not fire ants, I think this other species of ant that's able to build each other up even within catastrophic storms. And they can survive these because of community building and 
different types of um, things like that. So biomimicry does not have to just apply to our materialistic and not uh, our materials and resources and technology, but it can also be to these more abstract concepts as well. And we have so much more examples of biomimicry within our world. And what I just touched on, of course, was a tip of this massive, massive iceberg. But some of the other ones that I thought was, were particularly cool was this survivor finding robot, which is a, an, a 3D printed robot that is shaped like a spider. So they can fit into really tight, uh, tight environments, as well as have these really long spindly legs for both stability and, de and dexterity. And the other one was the SunBot, which is this nanotechnology that uses individual cells so they can shift towards the sun whenever it moves throughout the day, just like sunflowers, how they're able to shift their faces towards the sun when it moves. And the last one we have here is actually the Morpho Butterfly uh, technology. The, this was actually invented in SFU by Simon Fraser researchers, to, which is a security foil for documents and banknotes that shift under the light, almost like how morpho butterflies have colors that are structural in nature. So they're able to shift almost iridescently and then light, don't know if I can <laughs> show that as well. So morpho butterfly structural colors, if people are interested, please do ask me more about that at the end of my talk today, but I won't go too much in detail at the moment. And of course there are many more. If anybody is interested, I would highly recommend just doing a quick Google search of biomimicry examples, and I'm sure you will be fascinated. Um, but nonetheless, I would like to round out to our last activity, and I want to give plenty of time for people to think a little bit about this. And this is an eco-innovation design challenge. And I would like to challenge each and every one of our, our participants today to design. We can, you can draw and label on a piece of paper and show that on your screen if you are uh, comfortable with doing that or you can describe in a chat box and I might just open up a whiteboard for people to doodle on the screen as well. A physical invention or a new system that can be social ecological in nature that is, in, that is inspired by biodiversity. And for those who are up for a challenge, I would like to ask you to target your innovation to one of the sustainable development goals and I have all of them, all 17 of them here. And last but not least, but most importantly, I would like everybody to think big and creatively. Physics is not the limiting factor here. I know we don't have time to, to drill out the perfect plan, but shout out your ideas and anything that comes to mind when you were listening to our presentation today or something that you think could perhaps improve, that, that you can improve on from our, uh, our friends in nature. I'll, I'd like to give everybody a few minutes to just think about that, maybe explore some of that. And if everybody is comfortable, uh, I'll be happy to see your designs or listen to your descriptions. I'll see if I can do a whiteboard for people to doodle on. Um. Angela, are you going to be sharing your own design as well? or I will be. I'll do that okay. last. <laughs> awesome. Sounds good. I think I'll give everybody until 40, perhaps, or maybe 45. Ah, okay. Let's see. Gosh, I've got to do this.
think we're trying to put up the whiteboard, but we are experiencing some difficulties. <laughs> Hmm, yeah, I can't figure out how to share it, but maybe one way to do kind of like a virtual whiteboard might be to have um, everyone kind of maybe start brainstorming together a little bit, either on the chat or maybe just audio. Yeah. If anybody wants to unmute themselves, we would be happy to help with that. And if anybody do wants to doodle, I think there's an, I just shared a quick link for that. <laughs> Oops, sorry. questions though I would love to hear that oh Arnold had a cool suggestion about the possibility of being able to download information to people's brains like the matrix that could help with the goal of education perhaps that would be really that would be really neat for not needing to to memorize all those things for exams and like that I wonder how that would be able to, that could be inspired by different types of species. Maybe the, the cordyceps, the mushroom that's able to zombify ants in a way. Oh, <laughs> that, that's that a good a idea. Yeah, that sounds really <laughs> neat. Mm Oh, Chloe's thinking about mimicking the bark structure of fire resistant trees to make them more fire resistant building material. That would be really fantastic. I think I think using it with the fire resistant material from barks is uh, has been considered as a really prominent option for looking at building materials, but I think we should we can take inspiration from particular species that are able to, to do a little bit more than that. Wait, hold on. I just wanted to say it's 1.39, so we'll do yeah, maybe me, a couple more minutes. minutes. Thank you for that reminder. Um, feel free to share any, but any other uh, ideas in the chat. I'm sorry that we couldn't get the we couldn't get the whiteboard to work, but if you do want to show your design, feel free to open your video, or we can allow you to open your video for that. But a quick design by myself, not the best drawing, I have to admit, was I was thinking about how deciduous trees lose their leaves in the winter because they're kind of discarding their photosynthetic properties because of the lack of sun. Maybe we can think about how we can make solar panels kind of transform in a way to allow them to be adapted to more seasonal benefits. Maybe in the winter they can be normal, but they can maybe solar cells can fall off or flip over in a way to create a surface that can allow for water cup capture and a little storage tank here we can be opened and closed. Um, I'd just like to read out a few other cool examples, uh, if anybody has them here. An enclosed portable insect farm from Nancy, so people can grow their own edible insects. That would be really neat. That's a really cool, cool uh, source of protein, as well as um, kind of discovering how we can cultivate insects as a form of food. Um, Nicole talking about how a cat is sitting a system that takes a litter box and incorporates it into a compost system for a garden. That's really great. I think that's really in line with this circular economy mode of thinking. And Nancy was talking about fly larvae and I think uh, something less challenging for people and with plants and flowers could be beautiful. Yeah, for fly, uh, fly larvae cultivation it would be really neat to have. And 
really cool to be inspired by these natural phenomenological structures. So the Eco Innovation Design Challenge that I just challenged everybody to is actually something that the Biomimicry Institute puts on annually each year. And this is, this is open to anybody and everybody, students uh, to just other, to, from students to youth to adults, anybody can, can join by just going to challenge.biomimicry.org. And this is to challenge people to have a competition for curious individuals to submit designs that can help change the future of our resource use and technological mechanisms or societal systems. And last but not least, I just want to thank everybody for joining me today for my talk and participating in my design challenge. And hopefully everybody was able to be inspired a little bit when we look at nature again, to look at our ancestors with millions of years of evolutionary experience and take from those examples to hopefully better and find solution to our modern day problems. And I will be happy to take any questions, uh, any clarifications or just chat about anything that we talked about today. So thank you so much. And awesome. Um, so just sharing Audrey's idea. Yeah. Uh, she said those chimney like spon chimney like sponges are able to filter large amounts of water, and I wonder if their methods can be incorporated to filter large amounts of water at a time for a drink. Oh, that would be really neat. Oh gosh, I didn't even think about that. I think water filtration is definitely something that we can take from nature. Ecosystem one of the main ecosystem services from urban trees is their or even bogs is their water filtration properties. So they, of course, play an essential role. But if we're able to take those, take those designs and input them in areas that don't benefit from maybe urban forests, that will, be, that will solve a lot of our modern issues. For sure. We've got a thank you from Arlene. Thank you, Arlene. This was very, really interesting. Um, and, and thanks you. Uh, Nicole is asking, I wonder if there is a natural material that could inspire a different type of road surfacing that is more permeable. Oh, that would be, that would be really helpful when we're thinking about um, stormwater buildup and things like that. I, I, that would be a cool thing to investigate in the future. I don't know anything on the top of my head. Um, yeah, runoff is definitely a big issue. Uh, one thing that I actually heard of, this is a little bit different from permeability, was actually people, I think in Okanagan has been a pilot project, was to put solar panels instead of roads, so they can really maximize the solar input from really sunny valleys like Okanagan. And um, the pilot project is, I think it's being considered being put on a broader scale in cities in China. So I'm looking forward to see how that works out, but that would be a really great way to maximize solar energy output. Um, I just wanted to say, Angela, I made a drawing inspired by uh, innovations. It doesn't meet any of the millennial, the, the, the sustainability goals. It's oh, just good. more oh. about vanity. I'm holding it up. Maybe you can, oh, nope, I don't have my video on. So this is inspired by uh, the morpho butterfly that you showed, and it's got all the little scales that change colors. So I was thinking you could do, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there could be a more um, scientific purpose that could help solve problems in the world, but I just think it'd be cool to have like a color changing car and a color changing house. That would house. be amazing. Having Possibly colors. clothing, you know. Mm. Oh my goodness, that one color from one side, but different color from the other side. I think that'd be really cool. Having those yeah. color things, like the, actually the, the example from the SFU researchers, using that to create banknotes. Mm. They were able to use this for a bunch of other stuff as well, not just banknotes. I think they were looking at, um, oh gosh, I can't remember on the top of my head, but if anybody's interested, search up color depth technology or color depth security. <laughs> awesome. Um, just another comment off the conversation about runoff. Um, Audrey says, I remember learning in my marine pollution class that permeable roads are technology that is being developed. They are, yeah. Awesome. All right. Does anyone have any last questions for Angela? Any last thoughts? 
anything you'd like to share? Oh, oh, Nancy has a really good Ooh. thought. Uh, maybe instead of as many flashing lights on sirens or for reflective vests for safety. She's talking about the, the morpho butterflies and their scales. I think that's definitely a really good, good way to use that kind of structural colors and iridescence on these types of reflective vests and uh, for both safety and emergency as well. I think using that as, oh, actually that has been considered the morpho butterfly technology has been inputted into textiles. But I think that's also largely for vanity, but I do think it has a lot of potential to, right. to change into something for I think one of the advantages is that like it won't fade the same way that pigments would. Yeah, definitely. I would see if I can. Um. Oh, don't know if you can see this, but. Oh, there we go. We do have some some dresses that has been made from this technology that doesn't have, it's called Morphotex dress, which is pretty cool. And they don't have any of the pigment fading, as you said. And they're a lot, uh, they have a lot of different types of color design. Cool. That's yeah. awesome. All right. Um, so on that note, I think we'll start wrapping up. Is that, is that good with you, Angela? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, awesome. So once again, everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, we, we welcome feedback. So feel free to share that with us. And we do BD at Home every Wednesday um, at 1 p.m. So next week, we'll be talking about textiles with um, Mary Glasper, and it will be very awesome. And I hope you'll all join us for that. Um, if there are any last comments or questions, you can leave them in the chat box. Um, but uh, if not, thank you and uh, hope to see you again. Thank you so much, everybody. Awesome.